Every art form has its strengths. Books are exceptional at capturing the internal conflict of a person. Film can sequence kinetic action and inventive framed reality, and comic books can leverage the space between panels to stimulate the reader's imagination. The aesthetic sensibilities and language of a medium give artists specialized tools to convey truth, beauty, and wisdom in different ways, and the greatest works of art play to those advantages. Music can tap directly into our emotional veins, and so the greatest music, like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, is a veritable landscape of sonic emotions. When we turn to video games though, what defines the language intrinsic to our medium, and how does it either empower or constrain us? Games take cues from all these other art forms, folding them into its repertoire. But what are the advantages that games have over other mediums that gives it a robust language of its own? Well, let's find out. The philosopher Clive Bell claimed all art forms have an intrinsic set of formal constraints that frame what that medium can do. Paintings are flat representational structures that use brushstrokes as its modular pieces, just as poetry uses words, comics use panels, and music uses notes. Even dance has acquired a formal language of its own, but it did take a while for that to happen. Of course, art forms can mix and match between disciplines, and the lines between them are not impermeable, but it's worth considering what makes any given medium truly unique. If we turn to games though, what are the brushstrokes of our medium? Fundamentally, it's mechanics. They can be hard to define, but the best description of what they entail is what Chris Crawford calls verbs. They are abilities enabled by the rule substrate of a game that allow a specific form of interactivity. In video games, the first verbs were maneuver, like in Space War, hit, like in Pong, and compete, like in, well, the both of them. Our verb repertoire has expanded since then incorporating adventuring in Zelda, jumping in Mario, and shooting like in Gears of War. This is the color palette of game creators, and like any other craft, mechanics can be combined together in interesting ways to create emergent meaning. Games are exceptional at spatial reasoning and mapping collisions, and so they are inherently good at action. In movies, the expression is show, don't tell, but in games, it's do, don't show. Non-interactivity isn't inherently a bad thing though, however, if you can convey something using verbs instead of another medium's tools, these games tend to get celebrated. There is a reason Pac-Man and Tetris are the most iconic representations of what a game might be. These games create highly engaging systems for us to learn and improve in, all while being instantly gratifying to interact with. What's interesting is that game designers can manage the level of tension in a game by modulating the level of difficulty and fun a player is having, and often, this actually mirrors the story structures of other mediums. For example, in Tetris, the difficulty and complexity is always ramping up as blocks get faster. You have an overarching external goal in securing the most points and an implicit internal goal motivated perhaps by the need for mastery or order in the play space. The game also always ends in failure, which actually makes it a tragedy if you think about it. Escalating tension and the ability to adapt and overcome is ultimately what most stories are about, and even the most abstract games share this narrative thrust. With games, we don't witness the protagonist vicariously like in other mediums, but embody the role in all its conflicts ourselves. Flow theory, which outlines how challenge and a player's abilities need to rise proportionate to one another, can be molded to map onto three-act structures, the hero's journey, or even non-linear templates like in Detroit, to create a tacit form of narrative interactivity. In games like Left 4 Dead and Alien Isolation, there are even AI systems in the background that actually monitor the level of tension felt by the player, and then change the emergent game experience to make sure the player's sense of engagement is optimized. Aside from the ability to use interactive tension to map games onto different narrative structures, there is also a pure form of artistry inherent in the kinesthetics of Tony Hawk's, the precision platforming of Mario, and the gratifying feedback of Call of Duty. Games are masterful at engagement and fun, which contrary to popular opinion is not antithetical to art. In his book A Theory of Fun, Rafe Koster argues fun is actually a proxy for learning. It's how our minds reward us for engaging with intricate systems that allow us to grow our cognitive and dexterous skills. We all outgrow tic-tac-toe by the time we are in middle school, but a game like Go has as many possible game configurations as there are stars in the universe. According to Coster, there is more fun to be grokked from games like Go, having a much denser possibility space in mathematical terms, which is where the fun comes from. For those wondering what this all has to do with art, in ancient China, the game Go was actually used alongside two instruments and calligraphy as a way of assessing the skills of potential candidates into the scholarly gentleman class. Art has always had a performative aspect, whether it be dance, music, or theater. 
and some theorists argue it evolved as a selection mechanism in animals for us to gauge the worth of one another. This can be seen in how the boar bird creates elaborate nests to impress prospective mates, or how apes fight one another in tournaments for resource privileges. Play and art both share a common lineage, that being ways of improving ourselves or impressing one another, which is why we have no problem with the idea of calling Roger Federer an artist. As tactile systems that foster competition, cooperation and creative expression, games enable these evolutionary functions in powerful ways, and fun is how this all gets mediated. Fun creates a kinetic sense of engagement, which also gives creators the ability to leverage the tools of pacing and progression in more visceral ways. The intensity of the action on screen can be mirrored by the actions on a controller, so an exhilarating boss fight with your nemesis and brother Virgil in a game like Devil May Cry 3 feels more compelling because of the creative feedback and feel of the controls and moveset, heightening the narrative tension. A whole range of thematic emotions can be heightened by layering and interactivity, whether it be exhilaration in Shadow of the Colossus or whimsical exploration in Proteus. To be fun is to simply provide direct feedback, have the world be responsive, and to see your actions have consequences. In game design terminology, this is often called feel, and it can be used to enhance imitative representations in a simulator like Gran Turismo, or designing skillful precision challenges in Super Meat Boy. Games are not just limited to using fun to enhance engagement and control pacing, but can also deliberately craft meaning using mechanics as a metaphor. Eco tells the story of a persecuted little boy who was cast into obscurity for being born with horns, and it uses a specific set of mechanics to thrust you into his predicament. You are a disempowered kid, so he stumbles around and is hard to control. Having the game set in an isolated world activates our instinct for appreciating others, and so when we meet the Princess Yorda, players are eager to forge an alliance. The game reinforces this by forcing you to hold down a button to grasp her hand and solve puzzles that require cooperation. To create a sense of empathy for your partner, the game strips away a traditional health bar and instead ties your success to the well-being of your partner, an ingenious way to get players to be selfless. Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons makes you control two brothers with two different analog sticks, and the conflict inherent in these mechanics is a metaphor for the conflict between the brothers. Journey mirrors different stages of the hero's journey using different forms of interactivity, conveying themes as universal as death and resurrection by simply using movement through space. In survival horror games, you are made to feel powerless in the face of overwhelming forces, usually by limiting resources and reducing the player lexicon. The power of interactivity is that it can be purely about skill for the player in our world or try to mirror the states of characters in others, being engaging for either playful or narrative reasons depending on what the authors are trying to create. Interactivity is not exclusive to games, being implicitly a part of theater, books, and comics, but games provide a much wider tapestry for reader expression. Interactivity means the work of art responds to the input of the receiver, and changes its structure accordingly. Indiana Jones is a pulp adventure framed with excellent cinematography, but Uncharted takes the formula and layers in interactivity. The Lord of the Rings is a high fantasy epic, just like Skyrim is, and both leverage much of the same world building and lore language. However, Skyrim has additional tools to enhance a player's immersion in its world. But what differences do these similar media have in their respective mediums? In Uncharted, the best parts of those games are the set pieces, where the player literally assumes the role of actor, director, and participant all at once. However, Indiana Jones is more tightly paced, frames the action better, and can lead the viewer through its story with more verve, and so recognizing the limits of a medium is also important. With Skyrim, the fidelity and believability of the world may never match Peter Jackson's or Tolkien's epics but the game allows you to take quests at your leisure, uncover the mysteries of the world organically, and forge your own identity and narrative within the confines of its universe. A game like Half-Life combines these two features and gives players both a sense of agency as well as a directed thrill fest, but what it also pioneered was a sense of immersion. There are no cutscenes in these games, they take place in the logic of the world. This really started with the old text-based adventures like Zork and the best-selling Myst series, and also shows its hand in the unfairly derided walking simulators. In any case, this is perhaps the core strength of video games, what we will call immersion, where a world feels more real because its geometry exists for us to explore, and our participation in these worlds makes us feel like an active agent in the unfolding drama. There are three types of immersion. The first is world immersion, where there seems a compelling and engrossing backstory to the universe you inhabit, which is conveyed to you through the environment, this was called the mise-en-scene in other art forms. Just look at the brilliant, obtuse story of Dark Souls, 
and how a tale that subverts the traditional hero's journey is actually hidden in the game's environment, items, and lore, and not explicitly told to you. The Art Deco underwater dystopia rapture in the game Bioshock is perfectly molded by its architecture, sound, and audio logs, and shows us the remnants of a world paralyzed by wanton self-indulgence in subtle but powerful ways. Interactivity combines with interior decor, sound, action, and exploration to allow for rapture to truly enrapture us. This type of immersion doesn't just exist in the context of a narrative, but can actually be a world that exists parallel to ours. Game creators are building worlds out of whole cloth, and some spend more time there than they do in the real world. World of Warcraft is effectively a fantasy novel come to life, and players convene there with others as they would in the real world. Games like Second Life are built around socializing in an abstracted cyberspace, and a whole host of multiplayer games give a sense of community that seems lacking in the real world. Game designers are not just storytelling artists, but engineers of new societies, manufacturing worlds we feel compelled to get lost in. The second type of immersion is narrative immersion, seen in both linear and non-linear forms. The first is like playing the role of Master Chief in Halo, a powerful super soldier tasked with saving the world, except through systems, mechanics, and challenge, gets you to act out the hero for yourself. We are taking on the role of a protagonist like Odysseus in the Homeric epic The Odyssey, as opposed to remaining passive observers. The utilities of stories has been argued for centuries, but most agree they serve as metaphorical guides for how we should act in the face of adversity, or when challenges confront us. What better way to do this than by embodying the role ourselves? Nonlinear forms include games like The Walking Dead, Heavy Rain, or Mass Effect, where the game gives us alternative verbs to interact with, express ourselves, or sometimes change the course of a story. Unlike movies or books that are stuck telling a single tale, games have the power to branch out stories, let us test out counterfactuals and examine our choices in deeper ways. Children engage in improvisational play from the time they are two, acting out stories in dynamic ways to create coherent models of reality. In virtual worlds, kids can act out authored tales or forged stories of their own, whether it be in a game like The Sims or the infinitely creative sandbox of Minecraft. The final type of immersion is what I'll call systems immersion, best known in games called immersive sims, where you have a set of interacting systems that allow both narrative and mechanical expression within their bounds. System Shock, Deus Ex, and Dishonored all share this lineage, providing expressive tools for players to creatively engineer solutions to problems. Many argue the fact that games are play undermines their integrity as art pieces, as this is simultaneously frivolous and of evolutionary utility. But ultimately, play is most likely a way for us to practice skills we need as a species in a relatively safe, low-cost environment. Games test us on dexterous and cognitive skills, which are essential for our species, which is ultimately why we want challenge in our games. No other medium is challenging the way games are, as they have no fail states, and this led Jasper Jewell to call games the art of failure. This challenge built into the DNA of games is why games do extremely well at conveying themes of hardship, triumph, self-improvement and confronting depression. No perfectly manufactured scene from a Transformers movie will ever quite capture the joy of defeating an absurdly difficult boss in Dark Souls, because our participation in it enlivens the thematic act of triumph. Confronting depression entails voluntarily facing your anxieties in a safe context, and games give us the tools to do this. A game like Celeste even took these mechanical themes to heart and built a story around overcoming anxiety. On self-improvement, just think of the difference between a run-of-the-mill rags-to-riches story in other media and say an RPG where you level up, improve your abilities, and ascend to the upper echelons of society. Games excel at this language, and we have built an entire genre around this theme called role-playing games. So to recap, we have mechanics, exploration, action, immersion, interactivity, play, and challenge that are built into the DNA of our games. With verbs, designers can create mechanically intense and precise systems to challenge players for the purposes of play, or they can use it to tell stories. Because designers render a fully realized 3D space, environmental storytelling is one of the most powerful tools to tell stories and create immersive worlds. No cinematic rendition of the Renaissance can compete with the feeling of traversing the city in Assassin's Creed, which provides a stunningly accurate reenactment of a different era. In Gone Home, there are remnants of a family's life scattered about for us to uncover, and it's only by interacting with this space that the narrative of their lives reveals itself. Traveling to a fantastical realm like in Limbo or in Little Nightmares feels more compelling, at least to me, than a Roald Dahl book, 
as you are trapped in the nightmare, not witnessing it take place. With narrative interactivity, we may be pushing towards the holodeck of Star Trek fame, where we can envision any world and act out fantasies to see how the stories of these worlds will respond in dynamic ways. Now we are a long way off from developing powerful enough systems for this fantasy, but I don't think it's too strident to assert that this is the ultimate dream. What the hell? Perhaps I've been a little combative thus far. I don't mean to say games are superior to other art forms. In fact, I don't like dividing art into discrete categories the way others do. In my mind, games are just another one of human beings' attempts to make sense of the world around them. Instead, perhaps we can take note of the ways interactivity can enhance the languages built by other mediums. For example, representational art has always tried to get us to see the world in new ways. The Renaissance introduced linear perspective and three dimensions, just like how we transition from 2D to 3D in Mario. Picasso's Cubist movement was about portraying the infinite complexity of multiple perspectives simultaneously, and games allow us to explore these conceptual ideas using mechanics, whether it be by shifting camera angles in Metal Gear Solid, or shifting between characters and perspectives. Impressionism was about portraying how things seemed as opposed to how they were, once photography destroyed the representational obsession of the past. And games can help realize both these ideas, whether in photorealistic games like Gran Turismo or highly stylized games like Okami. Even abstract conceptual and postmodern ideas can be conveyed by interactivity, whether it be Thomas Was Alone's minimalist story or Metal Gear Solid 2's absurd self-referential antics, getting the player to be complicit in the creation of meaning itself. Literature is another medium that does an incredible job at harnessing the player's imagination to create art. Actually, I think games have a lot to learn from literature, especially in how they structure stories into chapters and can get inside a character's head. Monologuing may not make the best game, but games like Max Payne, Alan Wake, and Hellblade let the characters go on in stream-of-consciousness existential spirals that we get to witness and be a part of. Dialogue can supplement interactivity as we play someone, or be used in subversive ways to play with the relationship between narrator and narrated. Just think of Bastion or the Stanley Parable's omnipotent narrators, and how they mix with interactivity to make us question the idea of free will itself. Had been manipulated to accept it blindly. With music, we not only inherit an astonishingly robust tradition to complement gameplay, but we can layer it in dynamically in a game like Res to simulate synesthesia and tell a story about cosmic unity. <laughs> Maneuvering through space can be a musical act like in Sound Shapes. It can cue gameplay and pacing like in Rayman Legends, or can merge with gameplay to tell a thematic tale of triumph like in the Ginzo Tree level of Ori and the Blind Forest. Dance was used in Journey as a way to communicate with other anonymous players, not surprising given researchers have found that most of our communication is implicit in body language. We see fairy tales in games like Eco and Limbo, television's influence in the episodic format of The Walking Dead, and interactive poetry in a game like Flower. Again, Mechanics only broaden the way art can be expressed, and we should be encouraging cross-pollination. However, perhaps more than any other medium, cinema has had the most lasting impact on games. This is not just lifting the cinematic language to tell stories through cutscenes, but weaving it into gameplay. Designers sometimes use a fixed camera, like in God of War, to get the most adrenaline-fueled perspective possible or allow the player control for a more interactive cinematic experience like in Devil May Cry 3. Close shots are used in films to get an intimate sense of character, and games do this too, whether it be in the third-person camera in The Last of Us, or literally putting us in the action in a first-person game. Wide shots are used in games like Shadow of the Colossus to stress our insignificance in the face of a vast, unknowable world. You may think cuts have no place in gameplay, but think of how Resident Evil has fixed camera angles that violently shift between one another to maximize our sense of tension. Or how about no cuts, like the latest God of War, which does everything in a single shot to maximize the immersive trance. Where it really gets interesting though is when we think of the possibilities of blending all these tools together to create interactive storytelling experiences. Imagine Breaking Bad but with the ability to alter the course of the story, an action scene in a Kurosawa film but with us as co-directors, or a Dostoevsky novel that branches outward all due to our moral decision making. Oh no. We can define art by its formal properties, 
articulating the language and craft of a medium to reveal what is truly unique about it. We can also define it by its purpose, whether it be for vulgar evolutionary goals, symbolically encoded cultural purposes, or any number of definitions from Tolstoy to Heidegger to Aristotle. However, perhaps the most tangible legacy of art is its impact, its ability to transform both us and the world around us in measurable ways. Agency is something foundational in the lexicon of games, which is why our medium can be one of the most potent when it comes to becoming our better selves. Having the audience of an art piece be both its participant and creator generates endless possibilities for creators of the future. As Vasily Kandinsky said, the artist is the hand that plays. Superficially, there are quite a few well-documented psychological benefits that games provide us with. Games create a sense of flow that arises out of having a challenge that matches your abilities, the option to cooperate and collaborate with others in massive projects, and the joy of engaging with systems that want to teach us cognitive and dexterous skills for the challenges of the real world. However, is it possible that we can marry art with education and play to transform our world in ways previously thought impossible? In her book Reality is Broken, Jane McGonnell argues that games provide a vision for how reality ought to be structured. They teach us that meaning and happiness comes from taking on a challenge like in Dark Souls, uniting with others in a destiny raid, getting direct feedback for actions in an RPG like The Witcher, and fighting for a transcendent purpose framed by the heroic narratives of all these games. This is echoed in James McGee's book, What Games Teach Us About Learning, where he argues that our schools should take the lessons of games to devise more intrinsically compelling curriculums. Children play games because they create environments that cater to their desire to learn, and he argues by studying games, we can make education both fun and engaging. Some of the smartest games weave the themes implicit in games, like confronting hardship, learning to overcome and transcending oneself, into the game's story, like Dark Souls and Celeste, and others revel in the cyclical nature of death. We die, try again and repeat until we perfect the formula, and games like Nier Automata uses this to invoke themes like Nietzsche's idea of saying yes to life and perfecting it. There's also Mircea Eliade's idea of transcending time by acting out cycles, which allows us to escape profane time and become as gods. As Jasper Jewell argues in The Art of Failure, games give us a way of overcoming a deficiency they themselves create, which gives us the courage to confront real issues that may be haunting us. In his book Persuasive Games, Ian Bogost argues games can represent the systems of the world in persuasive ways to teach people about concepts like politics, economics, and morals. SimCity gives us a sense of the interweaving systems involved in managing a city, civilization the decisions inherent in coordinating a nation at war, and spore the arc of evolution implicit in life. He says games have what he calls procedural rhetoric, the ability to use rules to persuade others about a particular point of view. One of the most powerful examples of this is the game Missile Command, which forces the player to choose between defending various cities against the bombardment of nuclear weapons. This anti-war parable is conveyed with nothing but the anxiety inherent in rules and mechanics. Art games like September 12 or Peacemaker get players to make decisions as part of both sides of a conflict, forcing players to view the futility and cost of war, and how systems coerce us into making perverse decisions. This bleeds into something else interactivity does extremely well, which is empathy. Games can simulate the experiences of others by forcing us to go through what they do, whether in minor, thematic, or direct ways. In Uncharted, we get a sense of Nathan's thrill-seeking, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Cart life puts us into the role of a homeless person making decisions from day to day, Papers Please in the role of a border agent trying to feed his family, and Hellblade in the role of a schizophrenic, and it uses binaural audio and patterns to simulate her illness. Games can raise awareness, broaden our empathic reach, and help people understand individuals of every creed in ways I don't think we fully realize. This could extend to helping liberals and conservatives see more eye to eye, nations at war seeing their common humanity, or us to recognize the interweaving systems of our economies and our environment. Games also have the power of bringing together huge numbers of people, using our latent creative power for projects like Folding at Home, Fold It, or Charity Drives. The possibilities for leveraging games literacy for collaborative projects are potentially endless. Video games are still a very young medium, despite games in general existing for centuries, and we have yet to truly flesh out its unique vernacular in fun, engaging, and transformative ways. However, designing games is not easy, as it requires an understanding of the sciences and humanities to get right, creating a barrier to entry for would-be auteurs. As gaming literacy improves though, and more people come to appreciate the powerful language of interactivity, I have no doubt there will be more interdisciplinary collaboration that will birth experiences we can hardly envision. 
The future of games and the future of art are intertwined, and I for one am excited to see where they take us. Thank you so much for watching guys, if you have any more ideas about this topic please leave them in the comments. And if you want more content like this please subscribe. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.